It's Power Hour, LSU. PHL, extra little bit of swag, an extra little bit of taste. Let's freaking go! I'm so looking forward to each and every one of you because I'll be at the spring game. We're all going to sit together. If you want to sit with me, obviously during the game, I'm pretty locked in. Um, But if you are an intense viewer of LSU football, uh, I am the guy that you want to sit next to. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, we're going to have a good time this weekend with Lisey Dex Productions, and I hope to get to meet each and every one of you. We have uh, plenty of PHL giveaways and stuff like that, but we'll talk more about that coming up. We will meet at Mike's Cage around noon, noon 15, somewhere around there, and then we'll go in and we'll sit wherever you want to sit. How about that? Um. Obviously, the big focus is the spring game. But the spring game ultimately doesn't mean anything, right? We talked about it uh, in our last show that every single year there is a spring game standout who flops uh, the next season or the following year or that season, if that makes sense. I want to talk today about something that I disagreed with, with Brian Kelly earlier today at his press conference. Now, it's not a strong disagreement. It's something that I overall see what he was trying to say. But I want you to hear from the man himself. Go to the postseason section of evaluating this roster other than maybe to tackle other positions that you might target the transfer portal. I don't, I don't see any other positions that we need to be in the transfer portal for other than the defensive tackle position, really. Now, do I agree that LSU needs to go get a defensive tackle? Yeah. I mean, they already have done that. They need to get defensive tackles. Defensive tackles. With an S, that means multiple. And they already have Gio Paez. Uh, They had a really good one from Indiana who is interested in going to LSU. I'm really worried about Oklahoma in this battle for Phillip Bleedy or Blitty? Blitty, Liddy. And guess what? We've already done a Patreon breakdown of him. So go sign up for the PHL Patreon. Every new sign up gets a Joe Burrow card. I sent one out earlier this week. By the way, will Joe Burrow be at the LSU Spring Game? He's been at the last two, and it does a world of positive vibes for recruiting. Um, but for me, I don't think LSU's only position they need to address in the transfer portal's defensive line. I think it is the most important. But the first thing I I would say is I wouldn't take that as if Brian Kelly is saying, I'm not going to look anywhere else at any other positions. I think he would be open for the right transfer to come in. At least I would hope That is what he would say, that he is open to another transfer coming in at a different position. But I don't want him to be closed off to the idea that if the right player were to enter the transfer portal, that's a good fit. Because today, a young man by the name of Greedy Vance entered the transfer portal out of New Orleans. He is a fifth-year player. I understand that Brian Kelly um, said that he just wants defensive tackles, or that's the only position that he's very interested in. LSU has already brought in a bunch of transfer portal DBs during his tenure and in this class specifically. But Greedy Vance is actually good. I reached out to someone who I trust who's 
in that Florida State building pretty often. And he told me Greedy Vance is actually a really good football player. His playing time went down this year at Florida State because they had arguably the best cornerback duo in the entire sport with Renardo Green and uh, Cypress, both of which did a really good job versus Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr., which is something no other cornerback duo can really say. So, you know, I, I, I think greedy fans can really play. And if he wants to come back to LSU, even though we've brought in a gazillion Louisiana natives that have played at different schools, transfers, I want Greedy Vance to be on our team if he's open to it, right? We've seen a bunch of one-year rentals come back to Louisiana in their fifth and final season and do great things for us. Andre Sam, even though that was year seven, it was still his final season. We also had a great final season from Joe Fusha. Fouché, and we also had a great final season from Jarek Bernard Converse. So I am open to Greedy Vance. I'm also open to a running back. I am a little worried about LSU's running back depth. We don't know really what's going to happen to Trey Holly. We don't. There's still other things that are being sorted out in his situation. So it's not a gazillion percent certain if he's going to be available for us in the ne next season. All right. So for me, I would like another running back in this room. I really would. Um, and even if Trey Holly were to come back, your running back room would be Trey Holly, Caden Durham, Josh Williams, and Caleb Jackson. That is a very good running back room. I think LSU could survive a season with just four scholarship running backs. I really do think that they could. But every last single domino would need to fall in your favor. You would need Trey Holly uh, to, to, to come back to the team. You would need Caleb Jackson, Josh Williams, to stay healthy for the entire season. And while neither in their careers have been Unfreaking believably injury plagued. You did have Caleb Jackson miss his final season of senior high school football. And you also have had Josh Williams in and out of the lineup. So I, I would like another running back at the portal, unless, of course, there is someone else that LSU has in play. Maybe Malachi Lane is a better player than we're giving credit for. He is the fifth running back. He is the first walk-on running back to get reps, and you're probably going to see him a lot. On Saturday, we no longer have Corin Norman, who was a really good walk on back uh, for LSU, but he was more like a practice squad kind of guy. I think they need another running back. I, I do. Not as much as they need defensive tackles, but I would like another one unless they plan on playing Harold Perkins more at running back, which I doubt that is the case, but we'll never know. We don't know. But the one game Joe Sloan was an offensive coordinator and actually called the plays, Harold Perkins did get a carry. So uh, I, I don't think it is necessary to absolutely positively need to go get a running back. But on a scale of 1 to 10, how badly I think that they need one, I would put it at about an 8. I would. So we welcome everybody on NTOV. Good to see you. Tony the Tiger. Chance L.A. Mom. Tyler Townsend's in here as well. Good to see all of you. Now, as always, please feel free to super chat. Please go to powerhourlsu.com, get you some PHL merch like Tony the Tiger has in his photo. Please, please, please support me because during the offseason, it does get uh, tough. And I love making everything. Well, most of everything that I do is free. Obviously, we have the Patreon and so on and so on. So um, thank you guys so much. Now, next thing. First $20 Super Chat. We're up in things. Super rare. Grant Delpit. Blue Crack Dice autograph card. It's definitely a steal. But I want to give it out, and I'll send some other cool stuff with it. First... $50 Super Chat, PSA 10, Clyde Edwards-Alaire rookie card in an LSU uniform right there. So 
Clyde Edwards Alaire just resigned with the Kansas City Chiefs. And there you go. Um, I don't know which all former players will be back. I just got a text saying, hey, Carter, do you think Joe Burrow is going to be back for the third year? Um, I don't uh, I don't know. I really, really, really don't know. I would love it because it's really good for recruiting. Okay. Now, next thing. Um, I want everyone to be there because Lisey Dex, that's him. Big Dog Hamilton will be there. And uh, we're, we're going to be shooting some footage, shooting some content shooting some hangout sessions. So please come hang out. Tyler or Julie, excuse me. All right. Let's go to Julie's super chat here. And Julie, if you can type it out in the comment section so I can put it up on the screen. But she did say, hey, Carter, I heard Michael Braddon and one of his guests say that the rule is still in place that players can't transfer to another SEC team unless they sit out a year. Does that mean Lantern can't play this year for Tennessee? I think that's where you went. Okay. If you transferred in the last window, you can play for another SEC team. All right. You can do it. You can go from SEC team to SEC team. But in this upcoming window, you can't go from SEC team to SEC team. That's how I interpret it. All right. So you. You have to transfer in that first window, if that makes sense. Um, and there's multiple transfer portal windows. We have one coming up pretty soon. All right. And if an LSU player hits into that portal window, they can't go to Texas A&M. They can't go to Texas. They can't go to Alabama. Can they go to Wisconsin? Yeah. Like Jackson Howard can go to Wisconsin right now and start if he's good enough, of course. So, um. That's the way I understand it, Julie. But what I would also tell you is I don't know officially what to tell you about any transfer portal rules for this reason. Things are changing every day in Congress. Rules can be bent. There's always exceptions, right? Um, Whether it was Justin Fields a few years ago going from Georgia to Ohio State, he had an exception uh, th- there's always some type of an exception that you could find to get you to where you can be officially ready to go for the next year. But the way I understand it is you can't go from SEC team to SEC team, but we'll see. Okay. We'll see. Now we go to PJ. Will the spring game be televised? The answer to that is no. You got to come to the game to watch it. You can't watch it anyway. Kidding. It is on ESPN plus, but I would prefer you to actually go to the game. You get to hang out with me. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to hang out with me? Now, the next topic that I want to get into is Ricky Collins. All right. This has happened multiple times in press conferences uh, this spring that Brian Kelly has kind of gone out of his way to mention the backup quarterback battle. Not really just completely bring it up out of nowhere, but he would be in a stream of consciousness thought. And a little bit later, we'll play the full press conference um, if we have time. And he said, hey, you know what I'm looking forward to is this backup quarterback battle. And he said, Ricky Collins and A.J. Swan are going to play, quote, a lot. Now, that's not abnormal. Normally, spring games is where you see the backup quarterbacks in action. And I understand that people want to push a spring game to the side and say, well, you know, Carter, spring game doesn't mean anything. And I agree with you. I said that in the very beginning. The... There's little things that you could take away from a spring game, but you don't want to take too, too, too much away. But that doesn't mean it's not important for the players. Every single LSU player is never guaranteed a chance to play in Tiger Stadium, especially if you are a quarterback. All right, Ricky Collins had some spring game reps last year, but they didn't even put him in a red jersey. They just treated him like any other player. 
But now he has jumped up to the QB2 position, and he's trying to hold off A.J. Swan. He's also gotten reps at the QB2 position. It's going to be an interesting battle between the two of them. Could this be a situation where Brian Kelly is saying, look, I need to see something out of my backup quarterbacks for me to feel as if I don't need to go back into the portal and get another quarterback, which I don't think LSU is going to want to get another quarterback in the portal, but that doesn't mean that they are closed off to that idea. I think, and and this is how I would see it if I was in LSU's quarterback room or if I was an assistant to Joe Sloan. I would prefer Ricky Collins be the top backup. And the reason why that's the case is let's just say you're playing in a game and Garrett Nussmeyer gets hurt. God forbid. Knock on wood. But that's the job of the backup quarterback to come in for the quarterback who is banged up. Well, it is a little bit more jarring for the defense if the backup quarterback is a different type of quarterback than the starter. If A.J. Swan comes in for Garrett Nussmeyer, they're not the same type of player. Garrett's got a better arm. Garrett has a higher upside, playmaking ability, and so on. But they're similar. They're, they're pocket quarterbacks. Ricky Collins can give you a little bit more with his legs. He's not an unfreaking believable runner, but he's very good. I would put him at the bare minimum a Danny Etling level runner, which is good. Okay. Danny Etling, even though his rushing numbers were not all that incredible, he was a very timely runner when he was the LSU quarterback. That's something. That that's something. And if you're coming off the bench, there's different things you can do from that. This LSU offense is still very much going to be prepared to run the Jaden Daniels zone read principles. Having a backup quarterback or one that could come in every now and then uh, to run some of these types of things opens things up for your offense. And this was an LSU offense last year that struggled in the run game outside of Jaden scrambles towards the end of the season. So I am hoping Ricky Collins goes out there and balls out of control. I am rooting like you know what for him. I am also rooting for Colin Hurley. And obviously, out of any of the quarterbacks, uh, I would like Colin to succeed the most because he's been on PHL. That's how it works. If you've been on our channel, guess what? I'm going to be rooting for you the most. Huh? 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 So, uh, Colin Hurley, and of course, um, let's see who else. The four, um, uh, the 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 five players we interviewed a few weeks ago at the Shreveport Arklatex memorabilia card show, and I might be missing someone else. Uh, we're cheering for them. On Saturday, so I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you on Saturday. We got tons of VHL giveaways and stuff. Meet at Mike's Cage at around noon. Okay. Um. But honestly, I I, I cheer for everyone to succeed. Obviously, I'm always going to be very biased to uh, players. Obviously, that have been on the channel, players uh, that are from Louisiana. Um. They always cheer for the home state kids, but. I'm also in a position where I don't really care. <laughs> I, like, yeah, are there some players on the team that, you know, I, I talk to and and know their families and stuff like that? Sure. And, and those are the players that I ultimately, you know, get to know and all that stuff. But the bottom line is my favorite player on any LSU team is one that doesn't exist. It's whoever – actually gets the job done and helps us win football games. So there you go. Uh, I see Big Al in here. But we'll see. Now, Jordan with the super chat. <laughs> it says BK Wild. Okay. Jordan, any topic you want to get to, we'll get straight to it. Now, next thing. Um, Big story is breaking. And it looks as if 
the next Kentucky basketball coach will be Mark Pope from BYU. Now we repeat. The next coach, Mark Pope from BYU, who also had a first-round exit this year. Okay? Now, is it official? I don't know. I remember a few weeks ago, I say a few weeks ago, a few days ago, I told you guys, hey, I'm starting to see some serious steam for John Calipari to Arkansas. Mark Pope. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, I think it's going to be harder moving forward for elite programs to hire big-time coaches from other schools. Like, Kentucky is the pinnacle program. Mark Pope was their guy. All right. Was Kalen DeBoer Alabama's first choice? I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Huh? Huh? Because right, we do have Alabama fans that watch. But I just don't know. Like, in the NIL transfer portal era, how many basketball coaches in particular are going to be jumping to the bigger job. Scott Drew, Baylor, didn't didn't say yes. Dan Hurley, UConn, didn't say yes. All right. I just I just think coaches are going to be a little bit more stagnant going from college job to college job, if that makes sense. So I found that to be very interesting. All right. Uh, You know, Ralph, I read this comment, uh, this Hurley comment, uh, as in, I thought you were talking about the UConn coach. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, we we should see Collins some uh, this weekend. Um, You know, it's crazy. One one of Collins' friends is um, Anthony Richardson. They've trained together. Yeah, the Anthony Richardson, uh, the Indianapolis Colts. And I sat down and watched Anthony Richardson and really watched him for the first time. Like, just studied him, and I released a film study on the NFL channel. By golly, G. Willikers, if he stays healthy, he is a freaking cyborg. Completion percentage is absolutely brutal, though. He has got to work on that. But he is filthy. He is absolutely ridiculous. And my thing is this. The speed of your quarterback just changes so many dimensions for what you're going to be able to do. Like Patrick Mahomes is not the fastest, but they've done studies that he, as far as like game speed, is unfreaking believable. Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, both can run. And you know, I was I was watching Anthony Richardson. I was like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I was a young owner or new owner of an NFL franchise, wouldn't wouldn't it be nice to have a quarterback who who's as fast as Anthony Richardson? But also has been infinitely more productive, um, far more professional ready. An adult. And Anthony Richardson is 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 very young. Jaden Daniels is not that much older than him, but he is older. A guy who Shattered pretty much every Heisman statistical record of the modern era. Wouldn't it be nice to get that guy over a young man from Michigan who averaged 22 attempts per game, over a young man in the ACC whose mechanics were erratic? So I was watching all that, and I was like, damn, I would love to have Jaden Daniels be the quarterback of my team. I would love, 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 love. But that was something I watched when I was watching Anthony Richardson. But what I want to share with you is, you know, one throw that really stood out to me last year for for Jaden Daniels. 
And uh, Jordan, get your question in. Whatever you want to ask, feel free to fire away. Um, one one thing I want I want to mention about Jaden is Anthony Richardson is really good at one thing. Um, and he's actually good at a lot of things. All right. And Mick says, unless Richardson could throw with his feet, I don't see him making it in the NFL. Have you seen Anthony Richardson throw? I mean, it's special. I mean, it's anticipatory. The, the, the only thing is the accuracy and the completion percentage. And sometimes he'll just throw a football too hard and it goes through someone's hands. But, you know, the, the, the big difference is Anthony Richardson has like 20 starts in college and pro. 20 starts. He's just now learning how to play. And I I think he's going to be special this next year. I'm drafting him like crazy on Underdog Fantasy. Underdogfantasy.com, promo code Carter. Please go sign up. And, you know, that, that's – if Drake May was watching this right now, he would say, well, you know what, Carter? I, I'm only year three. Jane Daniels is year five. And that's true. That's true. Okay. I, I would I I I've made that point plenty of times that you know Jaden was lucky that he had the COVID year and it gave him that extra year. Right. That extra year is is what was critical. But he still dominated the sport, unlike any quarterback who's who's done it. Statistically, it was the best year. All right. It's 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 insane, absolutely insane. But I I, I am drafting a lot of Anthony Richardson on under all fantasy and a lot of Jane Daniels. A lot. Absolutely a lot. Uh, but to get off the NFL and back into college football. You know, I, I was thinking about how I I feel about the defense and, and whatnot at this spring game. Here's what I think Brian Kelly is going to do defensively in the spring game. Nothing. I think he's going to tell Blake Baker, hey, uh, let's run a lot of two high, one high. Let's not get too exotic. Let's make sure our offense looks great. And that's what you want to do in the spring game. Give that offense the confidence going in to next year. In the past couple of spring games, the offense has really done well in the spring games. And obviously under Brian Kelly, our offense has been more good than not good. Um, but we, we want to see the defense succeed. So, you know, we've talked about the defensive tackle position at length. Where I think Saturday will be the most interesting is that defensive end. All right. We know that on Saturday, the defensive tackle room that you will see will probably not look like the defensive tackle you're going to see on Saturdays in the fall. LSU is very clearly working the transfer portal for defensive tackle. They have publicly stated as such. I think defensive end is going to be interesting. All right. Keep in mind, LSU has a defensive ends coach. So this is not Bo Davis. This is Kevin Peoples with the defensive ends. And this defensive end group is going up against really good offensive tackles. Really, really good OTs. All right. Obviously, Emory Jones. Obviously, Will Campbell. But the backups, Tyree Adams and Bo Borderlon, are pretty good backup kind of guys. So our defensive ends are going to have tough matchups. If they make plays on Saturday, especially if they're beating one-on-one blocks, holding up the edge versus really good offensive tackles. How many offensive tackles will they play this next year that are nearly as good as Will Campbell and Emory Jones? There's just not going to be many of them. There's just not going to be many of them. So that is really one position I've circled because we're we're pretty set at defensive end. That's the, the group that we have now is going to be the group that we have in the fall. So that's Savian Jones, Paris Sheehan, Brayden Swinson, Deshaun Womack. Those are the big four. But you also have Ahmad Bro. 
You also have Gabriel Relford. You also have Dylan Carpenter. You've got a lot of names in there. That's seven ends. And C.J. Jackson uh, will, 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 will be entering in the fall. So this is a deep room with a lot of four stars and 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 guys with good pedigree and guys that you know transferred from big schools like Oregon on in here. Will this be good? Will this be good for LSU? Because last year we could not set the edge defensively. We 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 we, we just couldn't at all. And these are the same players off last year's team on this year's team. All right. So, once again, don't take too much away from a spring game. They're familiar with the offense and so on. But if that defensive end room has a good day on Saturday, that lets me know Kevin Peoples is a real deal. So, I'm really looking forward to that um, because. We just did not have good defensive end play last year. We really didn't have good anything defensively last year. But I'm I'm really looking forward to that on Saturday. I really am. I think if Anthony Richardson and Jaden Daniels raced, I think Jaden would, would smoke them. The difference, of course, though, is Anthony is way bigger. But this is this is the thing that's kind of pissed me off about the Jaden Daniels discourse. And it really has pissed me off, all right? There's a lot of people predicting that Jaden Daniels is going to get hurt. And I get why they say that. They say, hey, uh, he, he's going to get hurt because he jumps into a bunch of dumb hits. And Jaden would probably tell you that he does that. And, you know, I've, I've heard pretty recently that – uh, there, there are people around him that that don't want to see him do what he did like in the first couple of drives versus Florida State where he just jumped into tackles. You don't want that to happen. But this is the thing that that that, that honestly destroys my soul when it comes to the Jane Daniels dangerous play kind of stuff. He's never been hurt. He's, he's never really missed a game. High school started four years. College started five years. Didn't miss starts. But the guy who's bigger, Anthony Richardson, is always hurt. He's always hurt. So it's like you can't predict injuries. Just because Jaden isn't as big as Anthony Richardson... Obviously, Anthony Richardson has a far better arm. And, you know, he's a better goal line runner because he's just bigger. That doesn't mean that Jaden is going to get hurt at the next level. Who's to say Drake May, knock on wood? And I like Drake May. Doesn't get hurt. Injuries are random. They're random. Okay? You, you, you never know who's going to get hurt. You never do. But I'm getting sick and tired of that criticism of Jaden Daniels when what's happened up to this point has been the opposite. He doesn't miss. If anything, that's 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 a huge benefit. You're telling me that this guy who's 205, 210 can take all these hits, get right back up, and still play at a high level? So... It's it's and, I, and it wasn't at you, Pegasus. I know you didn't. I know I wasn't at you, but it's it's like the 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 draft community that never never said that about Anthony Richardson, but it said it ad nauseum about Jaden Daniels. He's not that big of a guy. Well, first of all, it's not true. I mean, he's six three, six three and a half, and you know it's an inch taller than the average NFL quarterback. And Jaden, if he would have come out last year and you said he was skinny, I'd say, yeah. You can find a gazillion live streams. Jaden's year four at LSU, year one at LSU, excuse me, year four of his career. Skinny guy. This past year, though, you guys saw it. Changes throwing motion, changes body. 
All right. But he is he's not two he's not two hundred, he's two two ten. And I understand the NFL hits way harder and huge hits do accumulate and you are slightly older as you as you move along in your career. Um my point is he does need to change. But you know, there there's quarterbacks that are way bigger than him that have had far more injury issues. Okay. Now, next thing. For me, I am not going to sit here and tell you that I am a women's college basketball transfer portal wizard. But what I can tell you is LSU does need to get some uh, point guards in the portal. I know a lot of you wanted the Virginia Tech lady that ended up going to uh, Kentucky, followed her coach there. But we'll see. Now, Tennessee is this weekend. Game tomorrow night at 6.30. Game Saturday at 4.30. Game Sunday at 2. All in Knoxville. Long way to travel. Long way. I'm not going to say this series is a must win. But it's a must win. Okay? You've, you've got to find a way to win this series. And you can. Baseball's random. Baseball is very, very, very random. Uh, but, you know, for me, I don't think it's really a question that LSU really, really, really needs to win um, this game. I think they need to win on Friday and then find a way to get one on Saturday or Sunday. They've had a few series this year where they've been able to win on Friday. Can't get it done on Saturdays. So type Y for yes, type N for no. You believe LSU baseball is going to find a way to get it done. Type Y for yes, type N for no. Okay? I am putting positive vibes out there. Now, haven't been able to watch this kid yet. Jordan Sears committed to LSU. 21 points per game. 43.2% from three. And a top 60 portal player from UT Martin. Okay. I normally don't like to comment on, on if this player is good or not. Before... I actually see him play. I've never, I've never heard of him before today. But LSU basketball desperately needed it, right? Um, Jalen, um, with Jalen Cook going to the um, the NBA, I wish Jalen nothing but the best. They really, really, really. Needed another point guard. Okay. They did. Now. Are they done? Can they go get somebody else? I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, hmm, this is interesting. Mike Gundy listed his house for sale. Hmm. Is that? Wait, I I, can't, I have to know if this is this is actually true. Uh, I, I I'm not one to ever like overreact to a house for sale, but I 
college football is not college football without, I'm a man, I'm 40. Huh? 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 What an all-timer. All right, let's hear a few more uh, questions here, as promised, uh, from Brian Kelly. Uh, hey, Coach, just, and we know that what you know Mason Taylor kind of brings to the table, but just what about the development of Mac Markway and Kamorian Pimpton to second-year tight ends, just how have they grown this, this second offseason in the program? Well, I think with um, uh, KP, I think it's, um, you know, w- I think we've always felt like he was going to be, you know, a dynamic uh, presence as a pass catcher. I think it was, um, you know, feeling more comfortable within, you know, the structure of the offense and, and understanding what to do and how to do it. And then, you um, becoming more physical as, as an inline uh, presence, as a blocker. And, and, and I think he's established, I think he's established that this spring where will he unseat Mason? No. Uh, but can he compliment him? Yes. And if, if ever that we needed him to go in there as the singular tight end, he can do the jobs. And, and I think that that's what we needed to see from him. Um, I think what what we see from from Mac is a guy that has improved in the pass catching and route uh, running and 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 I think more than anything else awareness in the passing game. I thought that there was a lack of awareness at times in the passing game. Now crossing routes and dig routes and things of that nature, there's a much better awareness, and he continues to get better in in the run game. So. I think we're really pleased with the development of both of them and, and Mason as well. I mean, he, you know, he's a, he's a player that we're going to count on much more than we did last year. I mean, he's going to be a central figure in what we do and, and, and Garrett looks to him as well. And, and so I I think that in, in this offense, the tight end will be featured um, quite regularly. Yeah, Brian, what do you uh, hope to get out of the spring game and how many plays you figure you may run by the end of tomorrow, Saturday? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll split it like we did last year where it'll be an offense versus the defense and, you know, that kind of crazy scoring thing. And it's really not about the scoring as much as it is about giving, you know, certain players that are in key positions the opportunity uh, to compete. Like um, – you know, we want to see some of our frontline guys go out and compete and play, but they're not the fa- you know the the they're not for us the most important players out there. We want to see KP, right? We want to see him in some key. We need to see the two running backs uh, in particular. Um, you know, we need to see the offensive linemen that are going to play key roles, um, and and so there are key players that need to really get a lot of work in this game that that we're I think focused on and and I think on both sides of the ball um as the game unfolds you'll see a lot of them and you'll know okay they're really auditioning that particular player today and there'll be other guys that get a quick hook and go all right they they got a pretty good sense of where he is uh, Coach, at the safety position, you have a lot of local guys yeah. at that spot. Uh, just curious about McBride and Rogers coming straight out of high school yeah. into the spring. How are they doing so far? Really well. Um, you know, Rogers has been a little bit limited because of the shoulder, so he hasn't been allowed to have the contact, but he's been in, you know, virtually all the drills. And, you know, he's starting to, you know, find his way and feel more comfortable, and, and he's gotten a lot of work in the last – probably a week or so. Um, and I think he's going to be a fine player for us. Um, McBride, on the other hand, is uh, rangy, athletic, and he's a guy that's going to factor in. Uh, 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 he's one that you'll see a lot of, right, on, on Saturday. And we're excited about his future. Um, I think he's got a bright future, so you'll see a lot of him on, on Saturday. Hey, Coach, uh, I know it's a new but, like, familiar defensive staff overall. Just what have you really seen from that defensive staff as far as communication, camaraderie, just working with each other throughout the spring? Um, 
Well, you know, they know each other, right? I mean, Blake and, and Bo, you know, work together. You know, Kevin worked with with um, Blake, you know, and Jake. So the, these are guys that, you know, weren't plucked out of, you know, different you know, areas and didn't know each other. So there was a natural fit there with all of them. And, and that's obviously a positive. Um, they're demanding, um, but they're not demeaning in, in any way. And, and they coach their guys hard. Um, but it's LSU and, and we need to bring LSU's, you know, defensive, you know, um, persona back. And so, I think they're doing a really good job and and um, getting our defense to play the level they need to. We need to continue to recruit. We need to continue to develop. Um, but I like the energy. I, I like the way our players have responded this spring, and and I expect our defense to to continue to get better. The offensive line is going to be the strength of this team, especially with all the experience returning. Kyron Lacey seems to be that wide receiver one for you. Who has stood out on the offensive side, one or two players, and why? Chris Hinton's had a really good spring. You know, I think, you know, I've talked about Kyron, but Chris Hinton's been really solid for us. Um, I think the last week, C.J. Daniels has really settled in nicely. You can see his veteran kind of um, experience starting to show um, as he gets more comfortable within our offense. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just, there's a lot of depth. I think Aaron Anderson's had a really good spring for us um, and he'll contribute to what we're doing. Mm, I just, I just like the depth of the wide receiver, you know, core in itself. There's, there's probably seven seven guys that can contribute, but you know Chris and you know certainly Kyron, um, CJ. I think Samson's had a good spring. He's beginning to emerge. Um, we're we're going to be in a pretty good spot there at the wide receiver position, offensive line, tight end. I think you know really developing the number two quarterback. There's another area that you really should pay attention. Too. I mean, there's a battle going on there right now for that number two position. Um, you know, AJ and, and Ricky are battling that out right now. They're going to play a lot on Saturday, and and they're that's a pretty good battle right now. So um, getting that one to kind of come together as well um, will be another thing. But I, I, that's what I like on the offense right now. Uh, you see you know, Harold Perkins and Greg Penn working a lot inside linebacker. Just wondering where Whit Weeks fits in in his second offseason. Um, obviously, somebody who's a great athlete and got a lot of playing time for you guys last year. They're all going to play. It's And Blake, I think, made this clear. Was he in front of the group last week or this week? I mean, all those guys have to be in a rotation. And um, West Weeks had a great spring. I mean, not a good spring, a great spring. So... I think you're going to see a, a, you know, a presence of, of all those guys. And, and certainly then it becomes down a distance, you know, relative who's going to be fighting to get on third down. These guys are going to be fighting for third down, but there's enough reps for everybody. We're going to keep them fresh. We're going to keep them active. They're all going to impact what we do. But um, I think if there is a, a, an area where we have depth and we have a high level of confidence it's at the linebacker position right now and feel really good about it. Feel really good about our edge uh, in terms of the defensive ends. Um, I, I think we're, we're really making great progress in the back end. As, as was asked earlier, uh, we have to be able to um, continue to recruit and develop uh, at the defensive tackle position. Uh, how about a kicker question? Today. I love it. I love it. Uh, Ramos, he improved year one to year two. It looked like his percentages and whatnot. What are you seeing out of him going into his his third year to this year? Yeah, he's had a really good off season. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know the numbers last year were, were fabulous, right? I mean, if he if he gets the uh, the kick against Missouri, which we still argue was was a good kick, they 
they didn't feel like it, I guess it was too high for him. Um, you know, he finishes right behind the kicker from Alabama in terms of percentages. So 13 for 15, um, you know, he was what, 70, 70, 70, I think. Um, so yeah, 80%, but he could have been 85, you know, with that kick we were factoring in there and he's, then he's top 15 in the country. And then, you know, 77 for 77, uh, pretty darn good efficiency. So we feel good about him. Um, you know, uh, the the operation, you know, is, is one that, you know, obviously is, is we feel good about the, you know, what we're doing there from an operation standpoint. But, you know, I, I think that looked really good this spring, PAT field goal. So I feel good about it. Good. Thank you. We'll see you on Saturday. And there he is, Brian Kelly. Uh, an eventful press conference. Now, Chris Hinton. <laughs> huh? 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 Let me see. Let me see something. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. I knew that that sounded familiar. So let me see if. Chris Hinton has any ties to Brian Kelly. So Chris Hinton is actually a pretty famous football name. Uh, he was an offensive tackle, Pro Bowl offensive tackle, who played at Northwestern. And his son uh, was one of the best defensive linemen in all the country last year for Michigan. So Brian Kelly knows Chris Hinton. I can see why he says Chris Hinton twice. Um But he did butcher Chris Hilton's name. You would like to think, especially Chris Hilton, who's been a very not dominant, but prominent LSU football player um, on this team, on and off the field. Uh, you would like, uh, and I'm sure he would like to have it back to, to say Chris Hilton's name uh, correctly, who's one of the more popular guys on the team, right? And Chris Hilton's probably one of the most popular players, period, uh, especially on PHL. Uh, so it's a long spring. I, it's the first name I've seen, uh, BK butcher, uh, this spring, but he has butchered names. He, he, he has, uh, one area that he probably, um, Needs some improvement. But, yes, I, I just looked it up. I was like, wait, well, Chris Hinton sounds familiar. I was like, well, he played at Michigan. Um, but that's not here nor there. I enjoyed the kicker questions. Ramos, obviously, there is a lot of hype with Kamarion Pimpton. All right. This is what I would tell you about Kamarion Pimpton and Trey Des Green. Uh, they are very similar players. Very similar players. And obviously, as receivers, they have far more upside than Mason Taylor. Because they're they're huge. Their catch radius is ridiculous. Uh, they're multiple sport athletes. Obviously, Tredis Green is an excellent basketball player. And Kamarion Pinton was an excellent track and field um, participant. What I would tell you is they are more wide receivers than they are tight ends. They just did not really play tight end in 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 high school. And I would not be shocked if trade as green is mostly used as a wide receiver um, at LSU. Like they actually put him in the wide receiver group. They'll put him with the tight ends because there's so much upside if you can actually see him become a great blocker. But, you know, they're more pass catchers. So you really need Mac Markway to develop. And I'm telling you right now, if Kamarion Pinton becomes a good blocker, he is virtually unstoppable. Virtually unstoppable. But, you know, I keep going back to Mason Taylor. He is so good. He is so good. He He's not otherworldly, but he is really good, and he will play in the NFL for a very long time. 
because he knows how to block. As a receiver, he's okay. He's not going to make you miss and go for 100 yards like Brock Bowers or, or anyone like that. He is a really freaking good tight end, though. And I, I, in many ways, he was he was underrated uh, last year. So, you know, obviously a lot to uh, pick apart there, but the Kamarion Pimpton stuff is very interesting. Very gifted pass catcher. Very, very, very gifted. So, there you go. Um, I have heard from Boots on the Ground that C.J. Daniels has started to pick it up some, which is good. You want him to. This is uh, a guy who led all of college football last year in yards per route run. Had a good quarterback in Caden Salter. Now, he's going to go to Garrett Nussmeyer. I, I think Caden Salter of... of like, is it a true quarterback upgrade from Salter to Garrett Nussmeyer? I think it is if you're a receiver because Garrett throws, Salter runs. Um, and Salter obviously is a very gifted thrower. Um, but, um, you know, CJ is going to get uh, some, some better quarterback play and better offensive line play. So I, I am really freaking excited to see CJ Daniels uh, this weekend. All right. Michael says, trade as green is the Eric Gilbert you actually wanted. Hopefully so. I think the difference between the two of them is obviously trade as green, the chances uh, that he is in the same mental state as Eric Gilbert. I wish Eric nothing but the best it is, is very unlikely. Obviously Eric Gilbert is, <laughs> one of the craziest uh, stories for multiple teams, Nebraska, Georgia, and, and LSU. The difference is, is Eric Gilbert was otherworldly fast, right? Tredis Green doesn't have that same type of speed. Uh, he just doesn't. But as far as a catcher of the football is concerned, he is way better than Eric Gilbert. They're not even close in terms of catch radius. So, I'll take trade as any day of the week. Huh? 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 Especially now. So, yeah, I, I hope you're right. I really do. And then, Brian Kelly mentioning Wes Weeks was very fascinating. You know, I would like to see what a linebacker duo wit and Wes Weeks would look like. They are the second teamers at linebacker. Will we see something from Christian Brathwaite? I don't know. That's going to be very interesting. If we can see something from Brathwaite. So, you know, on Saturday, the most important thing is I'm getting to meet a lot of you. Pretty excited about that. Once again, we'll meet up around noon at Mike's Cage. But I personally, um, even outside of getting to see you guys, I'm just really excited to be back in Tiger Stadium. I really, really, really am. You should never take it for granted, even though it's not Tiger Stadium. It's not a night game or anything like that. Uh, I'm really freaking excited for it. I really, really, really am. So there you go. But we reach this point. In the next 10 or so minutes, feel free to super chat. We'll go straight to your topic and we'll keep this party moving all night. I do not mind staying up all night and chatting anything LSU football. If you want to chat some LSU baseball, let's see it. Bear Jones homers three times this weekend in Tennessee. Calling it now. Let's go, Bear Jones. Let's go. Um, let's see. Is there anything else, like kind of, sort of, sports related? Oh, Jordan, thank you so much. I appreciate it. He wants to talk Jay Bramblett. Okay. First off, I want to say hi to Jordan. Jordan 
normally watches PHL by himself, but sometimes he's hanging out with other folks. Sometimes it's his wife, Zara. So Zara, thank you for the support. Thank you for complimenting the backlights and all that stuff. Really appreciate it. And I got to meet some of Jordan's friends recently on a uh, on a phone call. So there you go. He wants he wants to know about Jay Bramblett punting in the NFL. It's going to be really hard. You know, normally what like two or three punters of every rookie class make it. If that punter is really hard, it's really 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 hard because they play forever, right? A good way to describe being a punter in the NFL is how Alexis Morris feels about the WNBA. There's only so many jobs, all right? The WNBA has fewer teams than the NBA or other professional sports leagues. And the players in that league play for a very long time because the seasons aren't as long and so on and so on. Same thing is true for punters. Punters in the NFL, there's only 32 of, 32 of those jobs. And punters play forever. Remember, they don't make as much money as the other big-time positions, so they want to play as long as they possibly can. They obviously don't have to hit. They don't play as much. Obviously, as teams become more analytically sound, they don't punt as often. As Brian Kelly mentioned earlier this offseason in terms of the punt return battle, which will probably be won by Xavier Thomas, there's not really that many punt returns anymore. So whatever the case may be, it's going to be hard for Jay Bramlett to make it. But he's got a shot. He does. He's got a, he's got a shot. Um, you know, LSU has had a good history of, of punters in the NFL. Brad Wing, of course, is now in the XFL punting or the UFL. And um, Donnie Jones punted for a very long time in the NFL for the Eagles uh, from LSU. So uh, really excited um, for Jay Bramblin. And, you know, I'm kind of excited for for punter at the spring game because we will punt more. Ho- hopefully not, we won't. But, you know, Jay Bramblin – Barely got work last year because Jaden Daniels was so freaking good. So there you go. Now, thank you for that super chat. I appreciate it. You know, one thing that that really um, dominated our offseason chatter last year was the NBA MVP race. All right. I'll be brief here because it's not as public as it was last year. Because Joel Embiid bitched and moaned and forced the media to vote for him. This year should be Nikola Jokic's fourth consecutive MVP. It should be. Now, I don't watch as much NBA as I used to. I still freaking love it. It's just time. I do a lot of night streams and stuff like that. Uh, but Nikola Jokic has been the best player in the NBA. For the, it, this should be his fourth straight MVP. I would prefer Luka Doncic to win it. Okay, I have a friend that plays on the Mavericks, uh, and Luka has taken that guy's career to the next level. Okay, The landlord, Daniel Gafford. Um, so... Kind of pulling for Luca. I like new storylines. I, I really do new MVPs. So that's why I was kind of sort of okay with Embiid getting it, other than him moaning about it for so long and him ducking um, Nikola Jokic in a head-to-head battle in the regular season and the media still gave it to Joel Embiid. Doesn't make any sense. Um, Nikola Jokic, should, th- this should be his fourth straight MVP. But... You know, for some reason, the, they, they don't respect Jokic. Uh, the, a lot of the media doesn't. Uh, you know, for me, I truly still think there is a huge faction of people that don't, that, that want to prevent Nikola Jokic from joining the 10 or 15 best players to ever play in the NBA. All right. But the truth is, 
He's already surpassed Kevin Durant. And the only other modern era players, and when I mean modern era, I mean like post-Kobe Shaq era. Only Steph and LeBron are ahead of Jokic. That's that's it. That is that is it. Only Steph and LeBron are ahead of Jokic. Everyone else is behind him. Durant's behind him. Wade's behind him. Whoever you want to mention, behind him. Dirk Nowitzki behind him. Uh, and then after that, Steve Nash behind him. Jokic is better. Jokic, to me, is surpassed Giannis. He is surpassed Giannis. So... Now Jokic is is reaching this like this this next tier, right? Like I don't, I don't think he I don't think he'll ever catch LeBron. I I don't think. Um actually I I would put a lot of money on that. He'll 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 never catch LeBron on the all-time tier list. He has a better chance of course catching Steph Curry, but I still don't think that will happen either. Now, if Durant leads the Suns to the title this year, then Durant should get credit and and he should move ahead of Jokic, right? Cuz he that would be the first time he led a team to a title. Uh But yeah, you know, I is Jokic reaching Shaq territory in terms of all-time greats? I don't know. Like that's tough. Obviously, I'm severely biased. Uh, I'm not really that big of a of a Jokic like fan, um, but I'm a fan of greatness. So there you go. It, I just don't know if I can ever put him ahead of Shaq. Once again, that's my bias speaking. But you know, Jokic has what five more years of prime left? At least the bare minimum, three more years of prime. He plays a very interesting style that is not heavily reliant on athleticism. So you would think, you know, he is supremely athletic, but it's not who he is, right? It's it's just, it's just not, it's not really his game. Uh, But I don't know. (laughs) That's why it's, I, I, it's, it's tough when you do like these all time, Kind of things, but like even if you go past like the Kobe Shaq era, right? And you go in that era, so that's Tim Duncan. Is Jokic past Tim Duncan? No, no, he's in front of Kevin Garnett. I don't think that's any doubt. Do you you do Jokic over Akeem Olajuwon? Probably still Elijah one, but I don't know. I, I would probably have to put Yoke. I don't know. I'd have to go look at their resumes even uh, even more closely. I just think Elijah one is just the far better defender. Uh, but offensively, Jokic clears him pretty pretty easily. So, yeah, I mean. So Jordan says, even with Dirk Nowitzki. No, I think he's past him. I think he's past him. I think he's past him. Same amount of titles, more MVPs. And still going. Right? I would like to think that Jokic would, he's going to be all NBA this year. He'll make another all NBA. But yeah, a lot of those 90s, early 2000s guys are where he's approaching. The Shaq, Kobe, Duncan era. But I remember last year we had a gazillion Embiid versus Jokic debates on here. And you guys got into it. Pierce says the MVP going to different players is actually good for the NBA because it causes more conversation. Yeah, and, and and look, I one thing that is working against Jokic 
is he doesn't care. He really, like if he wins the MVP, I'm sure as a competitive person, that matters to him. But he's not like Joel Embiid. I, 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 will, I will go to the grave saying one of the biggest individual disservices we have ever seen was Joel Embiid getting the MVP last year versus uh, Nicole Jokic. That one will never make sense to me. And I understand statistically, Embiid was, you know, higher point total and all of that. But he ducked him in a head-to-head. He ducked him in a head-to-head. That should matter in a regular season award. I don't care what happened in the playoffs. But it would definitely be better for the NBA if Luca or SGA win it. Um, I also think it would be great for the NBA if the Thunder win the title. Or the Timberwolves win the title. And I, th- I think what makes this NBA MVP battle very interesting is next year it's going to be Wimby's award, right? So maybe this year is bigger for, for, for Jokic than we would like to think if you have this all-time great player in the wings here. Victor Winbignana. Here's a DM from Michael. He says, Carter, there's no way Jokic is close to Shaq. Well, I hope I hope you're right. That's tough, though, man. That's tough. And then you got people like Gilbert Arena saying Jokic is like one of the more overrated MVPs ever. And it's like, really? Steve Nash won the award twice. Derrick Rose won the award. Really? Mm-hmm. So maybe this is the last MVP before Win Binyana wins like 10 of these sons of guns in a row. Huh? 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 So there you go. You know, we'll see. I'm cheering for Luca. I, I, I'm I'm cheering I'm cheering I'm cheering for Luca, uh, and the most of all I'm cheering for my Pelicans. It is interesting though, like just like a like what two or three years ago, where like Zion was in these debates, and Zion still had a really really good year this year, and I think you could have made a case for Zion over Paul George for MVP, but. Man, my Pelicans hurt me. They hurt me. All right. They hurt my soul. They really, 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 really do. I don't even know if I can even watch the Pelicans in the playoffs. I re- I really don't know. I like it just it it hurts me to watch them crumble here at the end. Losing to San Antonio last week hurt me. Well, all right, y'all. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, no YouTube super chats, but 
We did get a few tonight. Once again, we up the ante. Fifty dollars super chat. We're giving out a Clyde over to Lair. So if you still want it, fifty dollars super chat helps me grow my channel, especially in the off season. But I do want to shout out Julie and the great Jordan Hadan. Appreciate both of you. I couldn't do this without you guys. Hopefully I see you this weekend for the spring game, Julie. Okay. And Liverpool lost today. That hurts me. It really, really, really does. Once again, Jared Jones, three home runs this weekend. LSU pulls the upset. They win two out of three. They win Friday, lose Saturday, win Sunday. And let's go Pels. Forget all this yoga dunk. Brandon Ingram coming back soon. Let's go Pels. It is. Pow. Ow. LSU. Boom. Ooh, Pierce. I don't know. I don't know. Now, if... You want more of me? Please go sign up for a PHL Patreon. You want more of me? Go to Power Hour NFL on YouTube. Check out what I've been working on there. And tonight we are doing pork chops. Night two. Let's go. 